All right, we will get started now in earnest, folks. Um, thank you all for joining. <clears throat> My name is Dr. Stuart Ablon, and I am director of Think Kids um, here in the Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital. And I have the pleasure of moderating uh, today's discussion uh, with some wonderful colleagues. So um, for those of you who are new to us here at Think Kids, just a word about us. As I mentioned, we're in the uh, Department of Psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital, and uh, we teach all kinds of folks, parents, educators, clinicians, really anybody who works with um, youth, our evidence-based approach uh, to helping kids with behavioral challenges. It's an approach we call uh, collaborative problem solving. And in our work, in our trainings, uh, we constantly hear from families, from teachers, from coaches, um, all kinds of folks, how kids and uh, sadly for that matter, us adults as well, can often display challenging behavior uh, when it comes to uh, sports and athletics. Uh, sometimes that's um, things like uh, having a hard time uh, being a so-called good sport. That can be uh, aggression, anger. Uh, that can be disrespectful behavior, talking back, not listening, excluding others, bullying, etc. All kinds of challenges um, come out on our playing fields. So we decided it'd be a good idea to um, bring together some of our uh, favorite colleagues who have experience directly in this area, um, in youth sports and behavior, to have a conversation uh, with each other and with you all about what we all can do to support youth and the adults who support them uh, in their athletic endeavors. And as you'll see, we think this is not only an opportunity, of course, to um, manage challenging behavior in youth sports, but as the title of this webinar suggests, a great opportunity to um, build skills, build relationships, um, and it's an opportunity for healing. A lot of powerful things can happen um, through sport. We are recording this webinar and we'll share it out to all of you um, later in the week. So if anybody um, is interested but didn't have a chance to attend live, um, that'll be a good opportunity for people as well. So what I'm gonna do in just a moment here is ask our panelists uh, to introduce themselves very quickly to you all um, and share with us where they work and their connection um, to youth sports and uh, behavior. And then we'll start in answering questions. You know, we, we run many webinars like this and uh, we often solicit questions in advance and sometimes we don't get as many questions as we would like despite a lot of interest in the topic. Um, this was not the case with this webinar. We were inundated uh, with all kinds of questions. Uh, and the other interesting thing is we had um, many questions had multiple people asking the same question. So clearly there are some hot topics. So we are gonna devote the majority of the webinar to those hot topics that you all wrote into us about, but we're also gonna do our best to preserve some time uh, towards the end so that we can answer questions um, live from you all and foster some discussion around additional issues um, that you bring up. So without further ado, uh, let me turn things over to my colleague, uh, Megan Bartlett, to introduce herself for starters. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Stuart. I'm really excited that you decided to put this whole thing together and bring this group of people together. Um, my name is Megan. I work with a team of people at the Center for Healing and Justice through Sport who, are, who deeply believe in the power of sport to do good things. Um, but fortunately aren't foolish enough to think that sport always does good things. Um, we are very uh, aware of the ways in which sport can go wrong um, and really work with coaches and folks in the sports space to help sport meet its full potential um, to do all the good things that you just said. So um, one of the leaders that I've been uh, incredibly fortunate to get to know over my career in this space um, is the next person on the panel here. Um, so I'm going to kick it over to uh, Barfield from the Urban Dove Char uh, Team Charter School uh, to introduce himself. Oh, I'm in Boston. Yep, good, good old Boston. Um, and uh, Barfield is up next moving down the coast. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Megan, for that introduction. And thank you, Stuart, for putting this together. Yes, as Megan said, my name is Barfield. My actual name is Christopher Barfield. Um, I am the school leader at Urban Dove Team Charter School on our Brooklyn campus. 
Um, and our school, and this is my 23rd year in education. Um, I served as a basketball coach for 18 years, as a dean, as a physical education teacher. And what our school uh, centers around is dealing with our students in severe trauma. We are a transfer high school um, and we take kids who have, we accept kids who are in their last leg of high school. Um, and so what we're dealing with, we're dealing with a lot of students who come, with the, come to us with a lot of severe trauma from home, from school trauma. Um, and so what we try to do is set our kids up in teams. So they learn our core values of team or leadership communication. Um, and they have their paired with a coach who is their life coach, their athletic coach, but also their life coach um, to provide that emotional, some emotional and social support. Um, so yes, that's a little bit about me. And uh, pass to the next person. All right, thank you, Barfield. Glad to have you here. Uh, we'll turn things now to Natasha, a colleague of mine here um, at Think Kids, longtime colleague and friend, uh, and one of our talented uh, trainers and, and consultants on staff. Natasha. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Stuart. And uh, I'm really honored to be here with these folks, uh, talented folks on this panel. I come to sport probably differently than, than most folks around this panel. I come as a parent of two kids who grew up in sport. Uh, from recreational level to competitive level and dual discipline. And then of course, once they hit high performance um, in single discipline for one and now a young coach. And so staying connected with your children often means getting involved. <laughs> so um, there was no getting around not getting involved. So I've been a long time volunteer, probably 10 years um, in my children's respective sports. Uh, I'm now the vice president of our local ski clubs board. Um, so a lot to do with coaching and coach training and development. Um, and um, yeah, that's pretty much uh, my background in sport. I'm really excited to be here. All right, thank you, Natasha. And I think now everybody's understanding your uh, virtual background there as your uh, son is flying above your head. Um, and I remember him where he uh, was small enough to, to barely get off the ground at all. Um, Rudy, let's turn things over to you, please. Yeah. Thanks, sir, for doing this. My name is Rudy Vehar. I am the uh, educational program trainer and supervisor for Olive Crest and their school, Olive Crest Academy, out here in um, Orange County, California. Uh, along with that, I'm also a volunteer uh, head coach for my son's Little League team. And upon that, I kind of grew into the role of being the president of the Little League, which I totally love. Um, with that, I've been coaching youth sports, football and baseball for about Oh, man, at least 15, 18 years um, and high school sports for the last 15 years along with that. So I'm here in the aspect as a coach um, and as a parent coaching a son. Uh, I've been, I've, been in, I've dealt with coaches that coach their, their kids and it's, it's a struggle. So I'm here to help with that and, uh, um, and just kind of give our coaches, I give our league and our coaches some, some other ideas, some other ways to build skills in baseball along with dealing with um, any challenging behaviors in, in that sport or football either. So that's, that's for me. Thank you, Rudy, appreciate you joining. Um, and last, um, I'll turn things over to uh, my friend and colleague, Dr. Bruce Perry, uh, one of my favorite uh, teachers to co-teach with. And, and Bruce, uh, you know, little known fact that our respective um, esteemed athletic careers both uh, passed through the same undergraduate institution. Uh, little known fact there. So Bruce. Yeah. <clears throat> well, hi. Thank you, Stuart, for asking me to be part of this. I, um, it's interesting. I've been reflecting on sort of sport and my connection to sport as I've been listening to everybody. And I, it's, I've been a participant. I was an athlete. Uh, I've been a parent of kids in sport. Um, I've coached actually, you guys probably don't know this, but I've coached at the collegiate level, the high school level and the elementary school level. Now <laughs> uh, I'm currently a track, the, the track coach and flag football coach for my grandsons. And, uh, uh, so I have a connection to sport and, but I'm actually a child psychiatrist and a neuroscientist. And I've been working with really all, all kinds of people and all kinds of groups to better understand stress, distress, trauma, how these things influence development. And as part of that, it, 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 in the beginning, obviously, the medical model does not reimburse, you know, you can't prescribe sport <laughs> and get reimbursed for it. But uh, we knew early on that 
participation in sport was one of the healthiest things that many of these kids were experiencing. And over time, we started to look at this more carefully and recognized, uh, and I hopefully will talk a little bit about that today, but recognize that, as Stuart mentioned earlier, participation in sport are people who've been impacted by trauma. And so I'm, I'm uh, honored to be part of this group and I've been working with Megan and, you know, Stuart and I work together in one arena, Megan and I work together in another arena. And I'm glad that, you know, maybe we can figure out how to get us all working together at some point. All right. Well, thank you for joining, Bruce. So thanks, everybody. Uh, as you can see, this is a, a powerful panel with a diverse set of experiences and expertise that we've brought together here. So let's dive right into things with some of our uh, frequently asked questions, the ones that uh, we heard from uh, the same things from a lot of people. So the first topic that I'll bring up has to uh, do with motivation. We heard from a lot of people um, with concerns about uh, kids giving up um, as soon as things got hard um, and uh, if they sort of didn't feel success uh, in a sport right away, uh, ditching it quickly. And so people are very interested in how to help um, find the motivation for kids to stick with things. Uh, and sort of an offshoot of that also was a question about kids who uh, love playing in the games, um, but uh, aren't so eager to to practice and put the work in um, behind the scenes. And uh, you know that's something that we've heard on the the pro stage as well uh, from time to time. So let me start this off by um, asking Megan to chime in on on this issue of motivation and kids who seem to sort of uh, bail pretty quickly. Um, how can we help folks, help kids and the the uh, coaches and parents with that issue? Issue. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. Um, I, you know, a couple of things come up for me when I think about this, um, and then whatever the hard parts are, I'm going to kick to somebody else. But um, the the first thing that I think is unfortunately a norm in coaching is that we tend to think that in some aspects of coaching, we have to coach all kids the same way that all kids need the same thing. And in reality, um, you know, every young person is different. I think coaches are really good at recognizing that when it comes to building sports skills, right? Coaches can see that they need to teach a young person how to do a left-handed layup differently, depending on their background, their um, coordination levels, their number of hours practiced, whatever those things are, coaches are good at adjusting to teaching those skills differently, but I don't think we're as good at adjusting to teaching these other skills like motivation differently for different kids. And so when I think about young people showing up to sport and the sort of spectrum where, where they find themselves, um, particularly around challenge. Um, I don't think probably coaches are doing enough work to recognize those differences and to recognize that like when it gets hard for some kids is very different than it is for other kids, right? So I'm not surprised that some of the questions were as soon as it gets hard, kids start to bail. Well, Actually, my thought would be probably it was hard for that kid a while before we thought it was, right? And so how do we think about where kids are when they're showing up, how much experience they've had being challenged, and what their experiences with adversity previously can do to how they show up? Um, and so as Bruce mentioned, he's the neuroscientist, so he can talk about um, what adversity does to the brain. Um, but the short version is that it makes everybody show up differently. Um, and it makes everybody's ability to tolerate challenge different. And so thinking about young people, and I would say even sort of removing in some ways, the association of motivation with it and say, young people are showing up in different ways. How can we give them what they need to want to be here, to want to experience that success quickly so they want to stay? 
um, and not just sort of chalk it up to, oh, they don't want to do hard things. Yeah, Megan, one of the things I, I hear embedded in what you're describing is sort of some of the core of our work, which is helping people to understand that what we often think is a lack of motivation has little to do with motivation and has more to do with things like skills. Uh, so it's not just about desire. And you know, I, I, I often say, uh, you know, I think most of us are really motivated to do things that we're good at. And Absolutely. not particularly motivated to do things we're bad at. <laughs> and if we want to help people get more motivated to do things they're bad at, the best way to do that is help them get better at it. Um, yeah. So, uh, and I think in that question, Stuart, you asked, like, they don't experience success quickly. Well, why not? Why aren't our coaches helping them experience success quickly, right? The best thing you can do is get a kid a win as soon as possible, um, and whatever that looks like for that specific young person. And it sounds like what you're saying there is that there's a heavy degree of individualization that is needed to get one kid a win, particularly in a certain way earlier as is needed than another kid, for instance, et cetera. So uh, just like we try to encourage people not to parent every kid the same way because kids are vastly different, uh, your advice is you got to coach differently as well. Barfield, I'm interested in your, your take on this as well. Yeah. I agree with Megan. I think motivation, you can switch the word motivation to fun. I think sometimes uh, coaches are so uh, entrenched on getting the skills and, and, and getting ready for the game from preparation. They're missing the fact that fun is really, is really important for kids to be motivated. Um, you can have kids who, kids who have less skill, but if your activities and your drills and your skills are, are, are very vibrant and lively and they're, they're having a good time, they're going to want to continue. They're going to be motivated by that. Um, we know we have some, some kids who will come to us who are just automatically trained to be robots in a way that they were trained coach priorly, prior to that. But having a level of fun and, and high-level engagement can increase the motivation. And one thing that we do over in our, in our network is that we, we really want to find out where our kids are coming from, right? Um, so our coaches, they have it, what we call our, our sports-based development intakes. So they ask them a series of questions about their history. Um, and a lot of our kids have physical education trauma. So the movement, being able to move around other individuals, they're not comfortable in their own bodies. So they're not competent, they're not confident, not control of how they move. And so again, part of that is creating activities, not only differentiation, but that's really important. You have to meet every student, where, every person where they are in order to get them to grow um, or to provide tools for them to grow. But also, again, I'm gonna keep going back to this, just having a good time. A coach smiling can help. You know, there are a lot of coaches out there that just are so strict. And I'm talking about somebody who used to be that coach a long time ago, right? Um, <laughs> thank God for Megan. <laughs> it's changed my whole perception of all of this. Um, but smiling, giving praise when you have the many victories, that's really important. That also helps motivation. If a kid missed 10 layups in one practice, the next practice, they miss nine, celebrate that that may motivate them to move on to, uh, to want to do better. So again, it's all around having fun and making sure you understand each child where they are and then you know, using whatever you can, whatever intervention is possible to help them grow uh, and become more motivated. Thank you, Barfield. And uh, gosh, I, lo <clears throat> I love that idea of the sort of intake, if you will. It just hearing you say that occurred to me, you know, uh, uh, as an educator, you know, you want to know something about your students when they come into your classroom. You, you want to have some background. And as coaches, you get all these kids showing up, you got absolutely no idea what their history in sport is in this particular absolutely. sport. What a brilliant uh, idea and practical suggestion there. Ru Rudy, it looks like you want to chime in here too, please. I'll, I also, I think said a coach setting up an environment at practice that not succeeding is okay. And knowing like they're trying the hardest they can with the skill they have. And when they are not successful, that's a moment that they're going to feel the worst because they want to do well. And so if my mentality as a coach is they want to do well and they're not successful, then my mentality is let me coach them up. Let me build that skill day in and day out in, in that practice environment. So when we are in the game, I know and they know they're confident that they're trying their best and they're doing their best. And if they do fail, they know they're going to walk to coach and coach is not going to scream at them. Coach is going to coach them up to let's, let's forget about it. Let's do it again. Let's just, you know, coach them up next time. Try this. And now that 
mentality and that brain stress is reduced and now they're performing at a higher you know performance that you would like and uh and that will increase success thank you yeah you know one of the things that also occurs to me in this discussion is uh, i i think it's important for us to point out that when uh, adults are concerned about a kid's motivation, we often also rush right to the use of extrinsic or external motivators to sort of lord things over kids to incentivize them to do stuff we want them to do or threaten to take away stuff if they don't do it. And what uh, I hope the audience notices right now is in response to this question, none of our panelists are going anywhere near extrinsic motivators mostly probably because they know that the more you use tangible motivators, external motivators, the more you eat away at kids' internal drive to actually do that thing. Uh, but also I'm struck by everybody's comments. They really get right to the heart of what we know does facilitate intrinsic drive. And, and that is feeling good at stuff, you know, a sense of competence, uh, having success, a, a sense of autonomy, uh, so they're not feeling controlled by coaches and a sense of connection. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think let's, uh, what you're all helping us do is shift to a sense of how do you build internal drive, intrinsic motivation. And that's all about competence, autonomy, um, connection. All right. Um, we're going to get back a little bit to motivation in a different way in a moment. But what I want to do right now is uh, shift to another hot topic. Um, and that is um, kids who hate to lose, which whenever I hear that phrase, by the way, I think to myself as a very competitive person, I'm like, wait, are there people who like to lose? <laughs> like, don't we all hate to lose? I guess it's a question of how much we hate to lose and how well we handle it. But this question of like being a quote, poor sport, another phrase I'm not so wild about, um, and fair play, you know, how do we... Um, help kids learn how to lose gracefully, uh, come back to it next time? How do, in essence, um, handle failure and uh, enjoy playing e even if they don't win? Because certainly there are plenty of kids who tend to have significant meltdowns if uh, you know they don't win, they don't score, they don't perform well, um, et cetera. How do we help support um, those kids? And, and uh, Bruce, maybe I can kick things to you here for a, uh, a couple of thoughts on kids who, uh, quote, hate to lose and, and struggle to uh, yeah. play fair. <clears throat> you know, I think the answer is related to what you, the conversation earlier. Um, when you think about what, what the sport and, and achieving or winning means to the athlete, um, the emotional reaction to not succeeding is is yoked to that. So if you have been in a sport where as a coach for a long time, you've been in a system where you've been learning that failure is part of the growth process, where failure is, is part of building excellence, that you don't win or lose, you win or you learn. And you know, that's when you have that mindset, you don't have as much of uh, an emotional explosion about uh, losing. And I think that uh, it's interesting. One of the things I see in youth sport, I mean, you know, as I said, I've been involved in sport at a lot of different levels, but it, and it does happen at a lot of different levels, these, these responses to losing. But if you have, an, ex, an adult who is not controlling their re reactions to losing, then the kids pick up on that. And so if you've got like a, a, a regulated coach who, who when somebody drops a pass, you go, listen, that was a great route. That was awesome. You're going to catch that next time, as opposed to what's wrong with you. You know, keep your eyes on the ball. You know, you ran before you caught it. You know, the way we as adults frame the activity will be the way the children respond to success and failure. So I think that that's a big part of it is that um, it, whether from, and I hate, it's not always parents, but sometimes it is parents that have been sort of hammering in these attitudes about su success and achievement and very often using, as you point out, Stuart, external motivators as opposed to the internal motivators, you end up with that kind of response. And, and 
the other part of this, and this is something that's a bit of a challenge, is that you know losing, even if you get if you're in a wonderful environment and you've learned all this internal stuff, losing sucks. And it, what you have to do is you have to regulate your disappointment. So you have to have some degree of emotional regulation capability. And different people are more reactive or and or more capable uh, or less capable of managing that kind of stuff. And so there are a lot of the kids that we work with that have had histories of developmental trauma, for example, are overly reactive. They're tuned up and then they have overreactions to relatively minor disappointments. And so what you might be seeing is, is the, you know, that their, their response, their stress response systems might be a little bit uh, activated. And, and again, this is an opportunity for you to think about, all right, how do we go as a coach, how do we go back into a practice environment and give these kids practice in losing and give them little doses of failure that they can actually learn how to manage their emotions little by little by little by little so that when it's a big event that that won't have such a huge response and it really is a lot of what we talk about in the, the neurosequential model for sport is understanding dosing and spacing and and uh and we talk about it with cps too right you know collaborative problem solving is understanding that stress is not bad but it's the dose of stress and the controllability of stress. And you build, you can build in those, those capabilities through practice. And that's what CPS does actually, is it, you know, Stuart, you can talk about that actually, but I think that that would be a really, really nice place for CPS. If a coach uh, was working with a, uh, an athlete who had trouble controlling their emotions when they would, when they had a bad play or they missed a free throw or they lost a game. Well, and so, so for folks out there who don't know some of the lingo, uh, Bruce referring CPS short for collaborative problem solving, um, which is something that adults can do with kids in instances like this. And I love what you're saying, Bruce, about, you know, if you're going to get better at um, handling losing well, because it, it sucks, it's hard, you have to practice it. And like anything else, if you practice it, it, it too, too extreme aversion, too hard, uh, it, it's too overwhelming, that stress. So you've got to practice it in little doses. And I, I, I'm, I'd love to have folks chime in a little bit more on, okay, so specifically, what, is that, what can that look like to support the kid who finds it too hard to lose, even in practice in the beginning? And it looks like, uh, uh, Rudy, you, you want to chime in and then Barfield after that? Yeah, so so at our school we we have the collab problem solving. We use our collab problem, uh, problem solving approach here, and when we do see those those challenging behaviors, the number one thing, as you know, story is we want to find out their concern, and and when you have a, a player that is upset, and when I have a player that's upset, and after a game that we lost, we obviously know what is their concern is that they lost. You know, we lost. And so we got to acknowledge that. Like, I'm going to acknowledge that. I know your concern. I know you tried. I know, and I want to acknowledge all his, and I've done this numerous times. I've worked with kids and players like this. Acknowledge numerous times how hard they work and acknowledge and I, and acknowledge the, the effort they did. And I know their concern and I know how much passion you have. And, you know, and then once I, I've established that and I've explained that to them, you start to see the the regulation you know start to see the body regulate and and the emotions are still there then we talk about my concern and i say you're a leader i see you as a leader i i i see your passion you know and and i want to make sure you know you're with your team and you're showing them that you know you you guys fought together and so talk to that then i let them so so what can we do right now let's go in there and go with your team and and so they walk back in there and then just the team collaborate, you know, together, you just see the regulation from, from that child. Uh, that's happened numerous times with some of my players and just bringing that CPS approach into that moment uh, has really helped me with kids that get upset when they lose, uh, when we lose games or they, or they're not successful, successful at the plate or whatever, you know, so. Thank you, Rudy. You know, you're, one of the things that caught my eye about what you were saying is, you know, we sort of can take it for granted that everybody's experience of losing is the same. Uh, but actually, losing can mean very different things 
to different kids and different kids can be very upset about different aspects of losing and what that means to them. And, and so part of what Rudy's pointing out is the importance of sort of not just taking that for granted and moving forward to intervene, but stopping and asking questions, being curious, trying to gather information about um, why is this so upsetting before you move on. And sometimes we find, you'll find out some very surprising things that losing means very different things. Uh, Barfield, you were gonna chime in. Yeah, I think that um, the language, I think at, and as we you know get further into healing and sport, the language has to change. So something that Dr. Perry just said a few minutes ago, losing is learning, right? And you call failure as feedback. Like, and those, if those things are explicitly taught early on with your teams, um, along with practicing how to lose and get that feedback, I think it helped. The other thing I think can also help is, and I go back to those intakes, it's very important to uh, ask uh, young players, like, how do you feel when this happens? Right. And then the biggest question that needs to be asked is, what do you need when this happens? It's really important to be collaborative. I, I, you know, coming from a place where, you know, I, I grew up loving Pat Riley. He was the man to me. The, it was his way or the highway. And I thought that was the way that you coached. But no, if you don't have any player input or buy in, they're not going to want to do what you need them to do uh, to be successful for their own success. So knowing what they need in that moment and, and, that, and, and allowing them to understand that, you know, teaching this along the way, like you're not failing, this is feedback, it's information for you to get this skill or get this better. And we didn't lose today. We learn what we need to do next time to get better. Just shifting that language and working on that. I know it sounds, it is, it's very, it's not easy at all, but just trying to get that mindset shift can possibly help kids get over the best way they can because none of us likes to learn, but in that sense, but it can help them a little bit. Yeah, and, and Barfield, your comment about um, engaging the child, making them a, a sort of co-author of how you think about this, what the solutions are going to be, what you're going to do about this, you know, that um, gives a sense of autonomy, a sense of engagement, of authorship, ownership, um, practice, uh, so, you know, there's a lot there, including a, a sense of control, because that's also part of what can be uh, so activating about losing is like, you can be incredibly talented. And that's the crazy and wonderful thing about sports. Y you know, it's not all in your control, um, even in individual sports, right? Uh, forget uh, team sports. So, uh, and it's one of the beautiful things about what it allows people to practice. All right, I'm gonna keep us moving here because we, we have a lot to dive into. Uh, this one's gonna dovetail with the earlier conversation um, around uh, motivation, because there's sort of a, a, a different, an offshoot of this, which is, um, you know, I, I've talked to so many parents um, about kids not wanting to participate or uh, saying they want to participate, but you know, a couple of weeks in, then uh, refusing to to you know get their uniform on and leave the house and and uh, you know go to the games, and that's where you know we parents find ourselves trying to sort of leverage uh, you know to, to sort of incentivize uh, kids to to participate. So what about the kid who? doesn't want to go to practice or games and cries, gets really upset every time um, when they seem disinterested or they just, uh, parents, maybe the parents, a big athlete and suggests all these things and the kid shows no interest um, whatsoever. Natasha, um, help us. What do you do then? Well, let's start with giving permission that uh, sports or athletics isn't for everyone. Um, so let's start with that first premise. So we wouldn't say that music is for everyone necessarily, nor would we say, um, so if you put a guitar in my hand, I would probably cry. I wouldn't know where to put it or, or where to begin. Uh, we wouldn't say art is for everyone. And so we also need to give room for that to, to, be, the pay, to be the case. So start there. Now let's move past that for a minute. Let's say you've done that, right? So we've made that assumption, we've given permission and the kid wants to go, says they want to go. And then when it comes time to go, we find the, the struggle. So that's a different, I think, uh, experience, right? So you, you, the kid says they want to go, you know, but then when it comes time to get ready, they don't want to go or they don't want to go to practice. They're kind of not showing up. I think the easiest place to start is to always assume that if they could, they would. 
And so getting away from this, this, you know, where it's that carrot, that dangling thing that we want to hold over their head to make them go and really assume that something else is getting in the way. And you touched on it earlier, sir, which is really skill. And then having that conversation from an empathic place and truly listen to the child and make time to listen and understand. We make a lot of time to sort of listen to try to solve a problem really quickly. <laughs> And that's everybody's kind of natural inclination. You know, we just we we don't spend a whole lot of time actually listening to understand. We listen to try to respond and fix. But you can't fix a problem you don't understand. So if you want kids to be able to get dressed and get to practice, you want them to to engage and stay there and not leave. Uh, we have to understand why that's hard for them. And that starts by first and foremost actually stopping listening, truly listening, and engaging in a listening relationship with them to understand, because then you can troubleshoot it, right? Then you can get to the place to collaborate and co-author solutions that we've been talking about earlier, but only once you understand what you're trying to fix uh, from that child's perspective. And you'd be surprised sometimes what's actually getting in the way for kids. Sometimes it's the things we think but sometimes it's really not the things we think, right? It, it can have to do with who's there and who's not there, uh, how they look, how they feel. Uh, so prepare to be surprised by just starting off listening. And I think if we can teach our coaches to do that, make the assumption that it's um, something's getting in the way and really listen to kids, I think we'll, we'll start from a good spot. Thank you, Natasha. Very helpful. And I think a, a good segue to a, re a related topic, which is um, what about particularly stress and anxiety? Um, because of cl clearly that it could be one of the factors in what you're just describing there. It might, it might lead to um, a, a, what it looks like a, a lack of interest in participating. But there's a lot of ways, obviously, the stress and anxiety can manifest itself in, in uh, playing and competing. Uh, a lot of pressure, obviously, uh, in athletics. Um, how can we um, help to manage the stress and anxiety um, that our, our kids experience competing? And how can we sort of ease some of those anxieties? And maybe, um, let's see, uh, Megan, perhaps you could uh, chime in here to start off. Uh, yeah, sure. And I think this, um, like you said earlier, Stuart, um, builds on a lot of the things we've already talked about. Um, I'm struck by the fact that Rudy said um, we have to create environments where failing is okay um, or even encouraged, right? Because that's how we learn. Um, and so that's something that a coach can do around their environment. Um, but it's also something that parents and other adults in a young person's life can help reinforce um, that we go to sport, we go to practice, we go to games to learn and it's okay if we fall down and it's okay if we, if I guess it's okay if we lose, sorry, I guess. Um, but, uh, uh, and I think one thing, another thing coaches can do around that particular issue is sort of model it, share it, you know, own when they make a mistake running practice, own when they, you know, sort of did the wrong thing, called the wrong play, intervened with someone the wrong way, said, I'm so, you know, I'm sorry, we, I'm sorry I was late, we started practice late. I'm sorry that when so-and-so did this, I lost my cool. Um, all of those things that help sort of alleviate some of the pressure of those moments, I think can be, um, can make a huge difference in what kind of environment a young person is showing up to and therefore what kind of environment they, whether or not they want to be part of that environment. Um, sorry, go ahead. I'm just struck by your advice and uh, how hard it is for people to take it when there's constant um, examples in professional sports where, you know, coaches have to make incredibly difficult decisions in the moment and they're not always right. And you know, the, the sort of term Monday morning quarterbacking, it's so easy for media, everybody afterwards to say, why'd you call that stupid play? Why'd you make this yeah. dumb decision? That was the worst clock management you could ever. And yeah. you see that, you know, most coaches are taught to stand up there and say, no, I would do it again. That, that yeah. was the right decision. <laughs> uh, uh, I stand by it. As you right. rarely ever hear somebody say, yeah, I sort of blew it. 
Um, you know, like, uh, or even here's what I thought in the moment, here's the process I went through to yeah. make that decision. And so this time I, you know, it came down to this or this, I chose this one this time, next time, maybe I'll try this and see if it, you know, I think both owning it and also explaining to young people sort of how you got there. The process is just so much more important than what happened in the end. Yep. All right, we, we have our uh, Q&A is starting to come alive here, thankfully. And while I said that I would uh, save that to the end, I'm not going to, uh, <laughs> because you know sometimes it's good to just take things as they come here. Um, so I, I actually think it's a good time to address one of these questions, which is, um, what do you do in the, in the moment? That's an important qualification. When you're frustrated with um, student players who repeatedly don't follow through on feedback, uh, and a lot of coaches can lose their cool when it's something that they've repeatedly given the same feedback to the kid again and again and again. So our attendees curious, what can coaches do? What tactics can they use to return to a place of calm and regulation and assume good attentions during the game? Uh, but, the, you know, kids repeatedly not uh, not following this advice. Uh, maybe I can ask Rudy, if you don't mind uh, chiming in for this one. Yeah, you know. First, I want to do the aspect that a lot of youth coaches are dads or moms of that youth team. And so I'm going to talk to the aspect of being the parent and the coach of the team. If that is your child, and this is what I always establish with our coaches in our leagues, the coaching staff that I coach with, and I even tell my coaches I coach with about my own sons, is if my son needs to be coached up, you do it instead of me. I coach, if I go and tell my son, you're doing this wrong, this and that, that is dad telling me, and that's personal. And he wants to be make me proud and make me proud of what his efforts. So if me telling him or my approach is too firm or too loud, that's going to affect him more in the game and himself and my relationship with my son versus another coach that goes and coaches him up in that moment that he is not taking that feedback. We're not doing what we're asking him to do. Now that's coach coaching him up to be better. And so if you're a parent out there and you're coaching your kids, I strongly suggest have that talk with your coaches. If that is your child out there that's not succeeding or needs to be coached up or not, ask, not trying the hardest, take a step back as a, as, a, as a parent and as a coach and allow your assistant coaches to do that. Because that's going to, at the end of the day, help your relationship with your, your child. And it's not going to affect that. I've seen numerous youth over the years, coaches that, not, not on my teams, but I established that I don't want to do that. But uh, on the other teams, and I know their parents, and they're on their child. And you see how that affects their own child and their relationship. Even after the game, you see it. And that's not what we're trying. That's the, not the reason why we put, as parents, our kids in sports. So I strongly suggest if that is you, Talk to your coaches, establish that environment with your coaches, with your own kids and their own kids. So, Thank you, Rudy. Uh, good suggestion there. Nat Natasha, did you want to chime in there also, look like? Yeah, go yeah. for it. I would also say, don't assume that a child understood the feedback, right? Just because you said it doesn't mean they get it. <laughs> So there are multiple ways to teach kids and to provide feedback to kids. One of them is to ask them, right? Well, what, what do you think happened there? Can you, what was your experience of that? How did it feel? When I say this, what do you think that means, right? If I say, you know, lean more forward, reach further, what does that look like? Let's practice it on the ground. So there's different ways to teach kids to make sure that they're even understanding the feedback. Sometimes a, a, a kid not following through isn't simply just lack of compliance. It's actually lack of understanding of what the expectation or the feedback actually means. So take a step back and go back to the drawing board, video it, do it on the ground, show it, demonstrate it, uh, ask the kids to, to reflect on it themselves. Uh, and, and when coaches do that, they, they're not only co-authoring, but they're starting to go back to maybe it's the, the words, like how I'm saying it isn't resonating with the kid. So don't make that assumption. Great. Yeah, I want to, can I just jump in? I think that um, the, in the moment is really, really tough, right? In the height of the game, um, everyone's levels of hormones are, are raised, but Natasha, I think you hit it on the nose. I think the delivery is one thing and, and do they actually know? So it's, that's why I believe, and you guys probably do uh, also believe this, there also should be one or two more adults with you coaching because 
that way, if I'm coaching basketball, for example, I told Johnny to do X, Y, and Z twice. It didn't happen. Okay, he may need to come out the game, sit down with the other coach, the other coach and explain to them exactly what happened, and then go back in the game. Because you know when you're in the game itself, sometimes you don't hear or see so many movements going on. You're not rational in your thoughts. You're not in your cortex, right, uh, Dr. Booth? You're not, you're not in your cortex in that moment. So therefore, coming out, having that conversation with somebody else, because that message is not being delivered properly, I think, if it's not happening right away, or well, the kid doesn't understand. Um, so in the moment, it's, it's really, really tough. But uh, to Natasha's point, after the in the moment piece, videotaping, having those explicit conversations, those explicit teaching on what I meant when I said X, Y, and Z can really help for the next game. Can I just follow up on that? And I, Stuart, Stuart, you're probably going to go there anyway. But, you know, one of the most important principles that we try to help communicate in education, sport, therapy, is that the your brain basically is very, very, very sensitive to complexity, chaos, threat, stress. And the first thing that happens in those conditions, game conditions, is that for the majority of us, our cortex gets less efficient in processing verbal information, new content, and so forth. So we we, we sort of regress and default to previously practice activities. That's why we practice all the time. The more you practice, the better you will perform. So trying to put new content into somebody's brain when they're in that state is almost impossible. So the, a couple of things that are really important about what we're talking about is, and, and it was brought up already by Natasha and, and Chris and, uh, as well, that it's about state dependence. It's like, when, when do you do this and how do you do this? Um, and uh, there are regulatory strategies that you can help calm people down and quiet them down. Maybe you open up their cortex a little bit better, but all too often what coaches do and parents do and therapists do is default to words. We're going to tell you what to do. And people are not yet you know, we're not in a position to process effectively that information. And so what happens is the athlete who's sort of dysregulated doesn't hear what you're saying accurately and they'll go out and do it again. And then you get pissed off. And because human beings are relational creatures, our affect, our emotion is contagious. And pretty soon you're co-escalating your team as opposed to regulating your team. And so, you know, Barfield's point about you know, the tone of how you present this information, you know, give people an opportunity to sort of disengage from the fray, quiet down a little bit. There's a lot of strategies that have to do with making somebody more open to feedback in the moment. But it one of the hardest times to do co teaching is in the midst of an athletic competition. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, I was reflecting upon uh, in uh, advance of this, I've coached a, a bunch of youth sports through my uh, three children. And the, the sport that I most enjoyed coaching was baseball, even though I played other sports much more effectively, longer into college, things like I did, my baseball career stopped at about 14. Uh, why baseball? I realized because Baseball has so many opportunities to connect and to teach in the middle of the game because nothing's going on for a lot of people right. during a lot of the game. You don't have that luxury in you know soccer, basketball, you name it. And, it, and I think it speaks to exactly what Bruce is saying. And the, the only thing I would add is that um, I, I do want people to know that you actually can use words, though, also to regulate. But what is not regulating is to sort of uh, correct, uh, respond to, to a concern on the part of a kid, uh, to let them know sort of your point of view, your perspective, what you want them to think about it. The only words that are regulating in the moment are empathic ones. And empathy is a, is a you know, hugely regulating thing. It's our, one of our most powerful human regulators. So, and sometimes empathy is as simple as repeating back to a kid in your own words what you heard them say so they know that you heard it, which does not mean as the coach you agree with it, but you heard it. And that can be very empathizing um, on its own. All right. Um, Stuart, uh, can I just add one thing about regulating in sport? Okay. I think um, 
I love what you said about empathy, um, but also making sure that folks who who aren't in the neurosequential model of sport, because if you are, and I see some of you in the Q and A's, because um, if you are, you've heard us say this many, 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 many times. But um, for those of you who aren't, for who, those of you for whom this might be new, the other thing to think to consider when we're talking about regulation is the opportunity to engage in patterned repetitive rhythmic activity, right? And how there are so many of those moments in sports that we might be able to repurpose for interventions when young people are dysregulated, right? So baseball is a great example. I think actually that playing catch is one of the most regulating activities you can do full stop, but definitely um, when we're thinking about patterned repetitive rhythmic activity that you're doing while you're connected and safe and, and with someone else, we typically use that as a way to warm up or sort of loosen up, get ready, transition into sport. But why can't playing catch be something that when somebody is dysregulated, they get to do as a way to sort of reset, as a way to get regulated, as a way to get back into the right parts of their brain to, um, to start to learn, to be ready for the teaching that Bruce is talking about, right? We tend to sort of want to, when someone is dysregulated, sort of isolate and contain when what they need to do is move and connect. And so there are all these things in sport that build on that need that are actually biologically respectful of what you need when you're dysregulated as opposed to what we tend to do. And so I think, you know, building on Bruce's point about how do we help young people be ready for learning in the best way that we can, we don't have to intervene with what is sort of viewed as punishment, we can intervene with things that are skill building, that are regulating, that are connection, that are rich with connection, that are all of those things that are all actually also good for you to, like it's good to play catch if you're a baseball player. Um, it's good to throw a ball against the wall with a lacrosse stick, right? Because throwing and catching is a core lacrosse skill. It's good to do all of those things that help build your sports skills as well. Great points, Megan. Thank you for uh, jumping in to add that. All right. Um, so there are a few related comments, I think, in the Q&A that I want to uh, handle sort of at one time here, which is you know, there's a, a comment about how do you speak to coaches who are not making um, choices that are biologically respectful? Uh, sounds like maybe that person is a, a part of the neurosequential uh, community. Um, and I think it relates to uh, something that a um, uh, somebody who's a part of our collaborative problem solving community <laughs> raises too, uh, which is what are suggestions um, for uh, players who do not have coaches that are trauma informed, basically, maybe they don't know what's biologically um, respectful. And I love the question that was tagged on here. What would Barfield tell his old coaching self? Love that. Um, I don't know, Barfield, if you can answer that on the fly here, uh, what Oof. would you tell your old coaching self? Well, the first thing I would tell my old coaching self is that they're all not the same athlete each come with a different skill set, um, not only skills, skill set when it comes to their social emotional skills, but also their cognitive skills and their psychomotor skills, right? All three are different. So I tap into figuring out who they are. Also more buy-in. I did not allow, listen, I, like I said, I was a Pat Riley guy. So literally I was like, this is what we're doing today. This is how it's gonna happen, boom. I had fun because my personality is fun, but I would have I would have really had uh, I would have really had our, our my team, my my players kind of give me input of what they want to see happen for them during practice. Obviously, you want to still tailor it to the way there's going to have skill building involved um, and learning team play. But definitely, those are two things, knowing where, who they are and where they come from, really, really understanding that and then having them have more buy in. I think that would help me as a coach. That's a great question. That I had to answer right on the fly. That was a great question. <laughs> I know, right? You could use some time, not in the moment, as Bruce was saying, to, to sort of, you know, think clearly what you would, uh, you tell your younger self. Um, 
All right. And, uh, you know, I'm seeing a comment come in right now from Stephen about uh, would we suggest intentionally building uh, sort of self-regulation skill building uh, into practices so the kids see those skills as important as sports skills? And uh, they said, as Megan pointed out, and you can see from Megan's nonverbals right now um, that, yes, she would agree with that. Uh, and the only thing I would add to that is um, I don't think you need to think of them as separate. These are sports skills and, and self-regulation skills are as important. They are as important, but we can practice and build those through sport, through what we're naturally doing. It's what we in, in our world call naturalistic skills training, which, you know, we, we have this weird idea that you can like, uh, you know, build skills in very didactic ways with kids, removing them from the actual, you know, experience and from the relationships in which skills are best built. That's why in my mind, sports, so, uh, you know, lend such an incredible opportunity of these naturally occurring situations that are relationally bound as well that provide an opportunity to do these two things together. Yes, yeah, Stuart, I think it's just thinking about them as those things too, right? That sports skill building things are also um, regulation building things and, and that you can use them in different ways. Um, I also, just to the question about integrating it into practice, 1000%, um, as I was obviously um, encouraging that to, that to be true, but uh, the perfect example I think we know of uh, in this case is uh, a coach here in Boston who's a lacrosse coach who um, created basically a regulation station. Um, he called it the zone. And the rules of the zone were that you could, um, anytime during practice, you could go to the zone and throw the ball against the wall with a lacrosse stick, right? Just as a way to reset. And it was totally encouraged. Anybody could choose to do that, you know, choice, some control um, to do that at any point if you needed a reset. He, you could be sent to the zone if somebody else thought you needed a reset. Um, and you could bring someone to the zone if you needed somebody to go with you when you went. And then the most important thing, or one of the most important things he also did would sort of stop practice and send everybody to the zone because like, let's work on our stick skills for a few minutes and get back to where we're going. And we can talk about it as working on our stick skills instead of just like, we all need to be re more regulated. Both are true probably. And he would also send himself to the zone. He would say, you know what? You guys keep going. I'm going to take 30 seconds in the zone. And he'd do the thing and then come back. And I think those are, to your point, it's fully integrated in what you're doing. It doesn't feel like a timeout. It feels like a way to build skills. It feels like it's a valuable, useful way to um, engage in practice. And I just think... Um, if you can change your orientation towards um, resetting and, and getting yourself back into things, then it makes a huge difference. Uh, it, uh, Megan, that reminds me of shifts that schools make, of course, in their use sure. of timeout rooms and quiet rooms and things like that. But for our audience, I hope everybody's paying attention to what happens in those rooms, not just what the label of it is, because I've worked with lots of places that rebrand that space, but it's the same space. Uh, I remember a school did away with all their uh, timeout and seclusion rooms and called them the opportunity rooms, but they didn't do anything different in those opportunity rooms, which I was thinking, whose opportunity is this here? Uh, so it's what you're going to do in those spaces that is different than what you did before. All right. We have a Can lot. Can I just say one more thing to that real yeah, quick? Please. I think okay. what would be really powerful in that situation has been when the, before the season even begins, you ask your team. When you're frustrated, what activities pertaining to our sport would you do to regulate yourself? And once they present what they are, then it becomes more buy-in when it happens. It becomes more automatic. I would always suggest using the kids uh, their buy-in. As you can see, I'm big Love on that. It. And putting together uh, a couple of themes for us in, so far in this conversation of giving autonomy and authorship to the kids. Uh, and by the way, if you're sitting here saying, but wait, I'm not sure the kids know what it means to uh, regulate or be regulated, you know, just translate that, right? I mean, ultimately the word uh, regulate means to sort of manage or control. So you can talk with kids about it. It's about managing yourself, your bodies, your emotions, your controlling, et cetera. Uh, you know, Stuart, just for once to, to sort of go off on that point, I think one of the most important things that coaches 
can do is is teach about some of these concepts so the athletes understand why they're being asked to do certain things and then they will you know again i i always think that if people understand what's underneath what's the mechanism by which things work they will come up with very creative ways uh, that uh, they co-develop collaboratively with teammates with their coach that i think will be uh, an important part of what they do either in practice or in, in prior to a game so a lot a lot of times the understanding these concepts lead to the development of very interesting rituals like the haka or you know the the pre-competitive haka or some other kind of uh, team building community building activity that's fundamentally authored by the team and it has this fun it plays the role of both regulating but can bringing the culture the community together as as uh, something that is stronger than any one of the individual component parts and i think that that's the beauty of team sport is when the magic of connection creates something that's powerful like that uh and not surprisingly bruce i am sitting here thinking there's a bit of a parallel process because i think that's in essence the power of your work which is helping people understand the concepts the mechanisms that lie underneath and then people engage around those in a way and collaborate and come up with good solutions. You don't dictate the solutions, you help people understand what underlies these issues. All right, a um, bunch of things in our Q&A, but also people sent in in advance about um, topics relating to bullying, arguing, racism uh, within the context of youth sports. Um, and, uh, you know, here, obviously, we're, we're talking about across the board, we're talking about the kids, we're talking about the parents, we're talking about the coaches, we're talking about kids bullying other kids, we're talking about parents bullying kids, we're talking about parents bullying coaches, coaches bullying parents, coaches bullying kids, you name it. Um, and there are lots of specific questions uh, about how do you respond um, to bullying like that? So th these are obviously very big questions, uh, but I guess I'd like to invite uh, any of our panelists at this point uh, to, to jump in and uh, pick up on any particular piece of that. Um, we have, for instance, in our Q&A right now, um, let me see, where's a good example? of one of these, uh, how do you handle a player where they yell and put down other players when something doesn't go their way? Sort of again, of an example of maybe being a bad sport, but could be bullying uh, in particular. Some thoughts from our panelists here, please. Well, I really think it starts with the coaches. If the, it, it's the coaches that in sports and like in anything, it always starts from the top down. And if the if the coach is establishing that type of environment of bullying, then it's going to trickle down to the players of doing it to themselves and, and setting that expectation. You know, kids need expectations. So setting the expectation in the beginning within the coach himself and the coaching staff of that's not going to be accepted in at within our coaching uh, aspect of it, it then it and then that expectation is going to chop down to the kids if that's not going to be accepted in, in on the team. And creating that environment, I think that's going to really reduce that uh, bullying on the field. And 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 it and in those instances of the the kid is bullying, or which kids are going to be kids, and kids are going to say things, and especially in those tough moments, um, that's again creating that environment of a coach pulling the kid aside and talking about that moment and setting that what is the expectation again, and and um, acknowledging the stress level and trying to find out the concern of what they what what, what happened. And then coaching them up and teaching them a, a new skill or how to handle that situation uh, differently next time. But I really believe it, it starts with the coaching, the environment the coach sets. And so, I, we, oh, sorry, go ahead, Barford. Who, who's talking? I say I agree, but I want to add something else to that. I think because sometimes our coaches don't know who they're dealing with, and so I think that what has to happen is that we have to find out where is this coming from, because it's coming from somewhere, right? In, in our population of students, we have um, we have students who come from, you know, just like a lot of inner cities, right? Uh, very high stressful homes um, with a lot of siblings, 
multi-generational households where a lot of that stress and trauma just comes right over to their anger and to the, to the sport. Um, and on top of that is also like, where's the level of security, right? A lot of bullies bully because they're insecure. So it's like, I know that's a bigger thing to tap into where, uh, what their previous experiences were or who they are as people. But I think, I think every coach pretty much wants to set the expectation as that but there's no bullying on, there's no bullying, you know, but if it's happening, why is it happening? And trying to find out why it's happening, when does it happen? Because it could be happening in different situations and then really trying to give that kid the tools by having these conversations um, to help them understand that it's not accepted. So I, I agree with you, but it goes, I think goes a little before um, the coach's expectations. And how about though folks, uh, let's see, Megan's about to chime in. Uh, how about though, um, coaches themselves. I mean, let's be honest here. There's so many coaches who rely on fear, intimidation, et cetera, to try to induce performance and motivation. And so, you know, in essence, they're sort of using their power, leveraging their power, uh, which is, you know, a, a form of, of bullying as well. Um, how do we contend with that? And Megan, I don't know if you, you want to you answer that or one of the other panelists. No, if someone's figured that out, please tell me because that's, <laughs> supposed, to, that's supposed to be what I do. Um, <laughs> um, but I think it's really complicated, right? And you're exactly right that um, that the, the, the sort of um, use and, and abuse of power in these situations is, is far too prevalent. Um, we talk a lot in NM Sport and in the Center for Healing and Justice Through Sport that we coach the way we were coached, right? And this is true of we parent the way we were parented and teach the way we were taught, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe, and this goes a little bit, I think, to what Rudy and Barfield were talking about, that um, first and foremost, of course, sort of reflection about that, right? About what did work for you and, and not just sort of blind um, repetition of the way that you were coached, right? So building some habit of reflection um, and ideally having someone to reflect on that with um, who is helping you sit, sort of is helping point out some of those moments for you, make sure that you don't have the blind spots or, um, or, you know, sort of um, that you don't rely on that behavior. So think just asking questions and being more reflective of your own practice. But I think also replacing the behaviors with something positive is also, you know, it, it's one thing to say to coaches, don't do that. But it's another thing to say, instead of not doing that, here's what you can do. And so when um, Rudy and Barfield were talking about bullying, um, one of the, one of our friends at the Urban Dove, in fact, um, was talking in the um, Q&A about um, building good habits, right? And building good habits when things are, are going well um, and starting, you know, all the way back to what we were talking about at the beginning, that you need to practice doing those good things when things don't go well. Um, and so rituals and routines and things that we can establish on the front end, things that we can establish when things are less stressful, that's the only way I think to get them to really show up when things are stressful is to, you know, sort of practice and build that muscle and put those good behaviors in, in place of the bad ones. Go ahead, Natasha. I think, you know, we, we, we say this a lot in terms of how we manage people, but I believe coaches do well if they can, uh, not if they want to. And at some point, as sports organizations or leaders, parents, et cetera, we have some advocacy to do here around how do we get the education and training that coaches need to be the best that they can be. It's, you know, if, if you came at this as a volunteer, as, as a parent, as, uh, you know, why are we expecting them to suddenly know um, how to, to teach regulation, how to, to come to the table with that skill set? So, you know, earlier, one of the questions was asked, well, how do we support them? How do we, how do we show up for a coach that isn't maybe behaving um, developmentally appropriately? 
Um, I think one of the first things we can do is to really advocate for some of that education, that time uh, for them to be able to do it. Now, again, that comes at a cost. And so I'm not, you know, in a Pollyanna world pretending that, uh, that, that that's, that's easy. Uh, but I think it's, it's incumbent on us to, to push that. If you're in a leadership position, if you're in a role where you can affect some of that training um, is to, to show up for them um, and to give them an alternative. <laughs> Right? So it's not good enough to say, don't do X, uh, but hey, look at this um, training module, look at, at this opportunity. This could be a different way to do this that's about connection, that's about healing, that's about training athletes differently. Can I make a point about all of this that I think is so really central to what we've all been talking about, but we haven't really been explicit about it? I think that the intention of everybody who coaches and is involved in sort of youth sport is that you're wanting youth to engage in something that's healthy, physically healthy, socially healthy, emotionally healthy, that they can continue to do as they get older. So it's a lifelong goal, right? We want people to be athletically engaged and physically active. We don't want to create, you know, the idea of youth sport shouldn't be to create an elite Olympic guided, you know, process, but that's what it is. I mean, what we've done is we've created an environment where we take kids that are not great athletes and we weed them out. And we do this in a lot of ways that are basically a, a, the parallel process of all the crap we've been talking about having a power differential, reinforcing, uh, you know, the better athletes tend to be, to get special consideration behaviorally and all kinds of things. And I think part of what we need to think about is how can we, how can we change that? I mean, how do we keep more youth engaged in sport, even if they aren't performing at this sk certain skill level? Um, how can we support parent coaches so that they feel competent? I mean, the, one of the reasons we have a hard time getting co parents to coach is because nobody wants to do something they're not good at, right? I mean, who wants to go get a, in front of all of your people, all the other parents in, in the school? You're supposed to go out there and, you know, they're sitting there judging you as a baseball coach. And I'm sure that, Rudy, you've got lots of experiences with how hard that is to get people so I, I think we just have to have a, it would be worth, you know, not, obviously not on this call, but I, I think that part of what we have to address, if we do this right up front, if we start the process up front, that's respectful, that's inclusive, that's skill building, that's regulation sort of enriched, I think that a lot of the problems we have with sport later on are going to be easier to address. Great point, Bruce. Great observation. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, clearly pulling that off is going to take um, time, um, energy, concerted effort over time. But it's, you know, organizations um, like Megan's that, I, you know, my sense is that's uh, part of your mission as a whole. Um, but we need others to be helping in that mission, I think is clear. Well, and, and we need the, we need the educational system to elevate sport to the same uh, place as math and reading. And in other academic topics. It's uh, very interesting that you say that, Dr. Bruce Perry, because that is the conversation we're having over here. Um, as you know, our school is a sports-based youth development school. And we, um, like I said, we attract the kids we attract, but our kids come here not athletes. And so we use team leadership and communication as a tools for them to learn those skills through sport. And something that uh, we discuss as a whole entire network leadership is that, you know, math or ELA is just as important as our physical education classes, right? And, 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 and athletic competitions, those things, especially athletic competitions, those things are, those skills are really important to be able to excel in life, learning how to get feedback, learning how to quote unquote lose, right? Those things happen in life and how do you deal with them? If you learn that through sport, it's gonna, um, I think, make you an overall better professional. So that conversation is a tough conversation to have because a lot of our educators, our teachers feel a certain way. They think that athletics is a privilege, right? No disrespect to teachers, right? No, I, I supervise teachers, but it's that mind shift. We have to start saying that, 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 that mind shift change 
and that all these things are just as important as, he, as they are. So I'm glad you brought that up because it's literally a conversation we're having right now. Well, if you look at the history of education, mm -hmm. it, it, the classic Greek education, where the, the origins of sort of what became, ultimately became public education, they spent half their time doing drama, art, sport, and then they would do the, you know, the classic cognitive content. And I think that that's, you know, I think that that's, there was a reason for that, you know, that it's education of the whole person, I think is very important. Anyway, I, 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 I'm sort of taking it like I, mean, I do all the time, Stuart, off topic, <laughs> off into the ozone. Off topic. I, was to Earth. Waiting, I was waiting for <laughs> how long it would take, but you held off for a long time. I was doing so well. <laughs> I know, but I saw you were unmuting. You just couldn't control yourself. Uh, I know, I but, know. you know, look, in that context, you think about it. I mean, what else has gotten squeezed out, right? The arts have gotten squeezed out. I mean, I remember when art on a cart came into our schools, which is you wheel the art cart in, you do art for 20 minutes and and you check that box and this sort of obsession with cramming more academic content in and i think this is a, another example of sort of the, the fallout of that focus which is ironic because if what we're shooting for is academic prowess and you know uh, performance on standardized test scores ironically we're missing some of the most important things to help people be available for learning in the first place exactly exactly now I realize we have some uh, folks here who are attending who are who are uh, saying, "Yeah, okay, Dr. Perry, but what the hell do I do with this situation, though?" <laughs> um, That's when you talk to Megan and Barfield, Rudy. Talk to. It. <laughs> well, and, and I I want to make sure that uh, people know that there are very practical things that one can do. I go back to Megan's comment about. Uh, you know, before we get too critical of, of people doing things that we wish they wouldn't do, it's mostly because they don't know what else to do. And is there good training? Absolutely. And I saw one of the comments is, you know, they're right there in Boston. Well, in Boston, you know, you can come see us at Think Kids, come see Megan's group. We, we can provide, uh, you know, practical answers to some of these things. So, uh, you know, when kids aren't responding, uh, to, to the same interventions, there's a reason for that. And you got to do something a different way. One of the things I'm hearing from everybody is that one of the most important things is to stop and to try to listen and to understand that there is no magic solution, uh, but it's going to require connection and understanding what's giving rise to it and assuming the best out of the kid, the parent, the coach, et cetera, as Natasha shared our, our mantra, uh, not only kids do well if they can, but people do well if they can. Let's try to figure out what's going on and we're gonna have to do it outside of the moment. Um, I wanna uh, squeeze in a couple more practical things though. Somewhere in here, someone uh, was asking a question about, where is it here? Um, about uh, telling how to tell a coach. Yeah, here it is. What's a good way to talk to the coach to let them know that uh, somebody's child has challenges and might respond differently than most kids? Any advice um, for uh, also other kids noticing your kids' differences and, and perhaps um, uh, ending up with uh, the child becoming a bit of an outcast on the team? Uh, Rudy, is that one you wanted yeah. to? Please. Yeah, yeah so, so you know, in Clara problem solving, we talk about changing the lens and watching kids with challenging behaviors. And that's something that I've done with actually a coach recently of he, he knew my background with the schools I work with, and he saw the concern, the challenging behavior, he saw the, the not focus, and he saw all these challenging behaviors that he calls and his coaching calls, staff calls. And he wanted me just to observe and to, and to see what I see in my background you know, observing the kid and, and just, you know, with my experience, I was able to see sensory issues and parents haven't shared anything about the child's background. I'm not, I don't know what the child's background is or diagnosis, but just see observing, I was able to see the sensory issues, the, the noise, uh, the lack of communication, um, the lack of eye contact. I saw a lot of sudden, this is football. And the, the coaches was very, the coach shared about, um, it's frustrating because he's not listening it's frustrating because he's not paying attention he's walking away it's frustrating he's not doing what we're doing it's frustrating because it's all frustrated frustrating so after i kind of showed him like okay the sensory things the, the noises the engaging and i go but he's wanting engagement he's trying to get friends 
I was able to just share changing the lens of that coach. And I, I asked him, stop being a coach right now and think about him. What do you want to know about him? Get a buy-in from him and learn and build a relationship with him and see what we can do in the environment as a, the sport to get him engaged because he comes every day. He's not paying attention, but he comes every day. And why do you think he comes? And the, the coach was like, well, he likes friendships. He likes his peers. And okay, so, and I'm just trying to change that compassion, showing, you know, with that child. Eventually we found out he likes Pokemon. So the coach ended up changing play names to Pokemon names and the kid was engaged and the kid now took ownership and he put the kid into uh, leading exercises. Uh, now the kid comes and he starts on the offensive line and he is paying attention, but it's the change in the lens of the coaches to say, okay, let me see what else I can do thinking outside of sports. And um, I think that's a great way if, if parents are going to approach it that way is, is get to know the kid, share the coach what you can or what you would like and share what they like and try to just change the lens of the coach of, of him, not just see him as a baseball or football player or any player, see him as who he is um, and go from there. Thank you, Rudy. Uh, we're gonna squeeze in a couple other quick ones here. Um, uh, here's a comment. Many coaches feel that their guys lack mental toughness. How would you address this? People lacking mental toughness. What does that mean? <laughs> what does mental toughness mean, right? Does mental toughness mean I'm going for a layup and I don't want to get hit, so I avoid getting hit? That mental toughness? Or is that just fear of getting hit, right? Like, like so I think that's a hard question to, to handle. I mean, again, old Chris Barfield, coming from the <laughs> Pat Riley days, right, would say stuff like that, right? You're not tough enough, not mentally tough enough. It's the game. You got to get through it. Um, it's part of life, part of life. But again, our kids don't come with that tool, right? Their brain's not fully developed. Um, and again, a lot of the times, our coaches don't have the tool to actually teach what you, they even mean by that. So I guess to, to answer the question or not answer the question, I'm giving the comments basically, because that's just a very hard question to answer, is that what's the definition of mental toughness in your eyes? And how would you as a coach be able to explicitly teach what that means and how to overcome that? You have to provide that definition. So there you go. Find out what the, more about what they mean by it and help them see it as a skill, as something to be developed, whatever that thing is, which we've got to help them define a bit better. All right, we've got a, an attendee who is asking, how young is too young to, uh, it looks like to practice emotion regulation skills? What age is best to begin the foundation of emotion regulation? And they're talking little league, five to six year olds having meltdowns, not getting their way, not paying the, playing the position they want. I can't imagine why you'd have a bunch of meltdowns from five or six year olds playing little league. Um, I, I tell you what, it is, I, I love watching little league at that age because it is just a riot. It is, I mean, you see everything on display right there. I don't know what the rest of the group thinks, but I would say it's never too young to practice emotion regulation. Um, you know, first months of life, that's when the kids, uh, even before that, are beginning to learn how to regulate. Uh, but five and six year olds, the reason they're all melting down right and left is because they're being asked to display skills that they are trying their best to develop. What an incredible opportunity to do it. That's right where you want to uh, take the opportunity and run with it. Megan, do you want to add something there? I have a two and a half year old. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, he's a master regulator. Um, but, but I think to your point, it, I, I really do think it's never too early. And to Bruce's point way back earlier, when we were talking about introducing these concepts so people understand them. So you, you know, that, that I can tell that, you know, sometimes I, and, and your point about empathy too, Stuart, you know, I can tell that you're upset. I can tell that you're frustrated. When we're frustrated, we don't hit mommy. <laughs> um, but actually, what do we do instead? Right? Because it's one thing again, to say, when you're frustrated, we don't hit mommy, but it's another to say, when you're frustrated, it's harder to make good decisions. It's harder to do things the right way. Um, what can we do instead? Um, like I said, he's he's a, he's a perfect at it at two and a half. But um, but I do think the more 
the earlier, the better, and the more practice, the better. Um, and on helping them understand that you see what's going on for them and that they can understand what's going on for them is going to make such a huge difference in the long run. Just like a, a, an add on a point to this, that <clears throat> one of the things that is has happened with youth sport is that we've we've pushed team sports further down the developmental spectrum to the point where you're asking uh, developmentally immature children to manage complex social sport activities that are impossible. And that that's why it's so frustrating. So this is why if you're doing youth sport for baseball and basketball, you really should focus on skill building as opposed to full blown game and competition. And so, you know, you do two on two, or you, or if you get to bat three on three, or you do, uh, you know, you just have a hitting contest or a throwing con, you know, you can have all kinds of sport re activities related to that sport that are more dyadic and are more developmentally appropriate. And then when you add in more players, it just gets competitive, it's just crazy and confusing and it more meltdowns. Same thing with you, you, watching kids at age play soccer is hilarious. It's like watching like 10 little things buzz around following a ball. You know, the idea of like going to a certain place on the field, it, 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 it's hilarious to watch coaches go, now you need to go over there and over there. They don't even know what you're talking about. Even when they draw, they're not developmentally mature enough to even understand a map of the field. So when you say you go over here, you go over here, they don't know what the hell you're talking about. Right. All they see is ball and go. Yeah, go, <laughs> net, good. <laughs> okay. But Bruce, even at an, a slightly older age, you had to walk your grandson's kids around the track so they understood what the lines were. Exactly. That's exactly right. right. You know, they just, you, 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 we make so many weird assumptions that they're, that, that we say something to them once and they get it. And they, their kids are so good at sort of giving us this nonverbal feedback that they, they want us to kind of a, leave them alone or, or move on <laughs> to the next kid <laughs> that half the time we think that we communicated something that they didn't process. Well, and, and you're reminding me of something we say all the time, which is when you see challenging behavior, uh, it, it just means there's a gap between the exactly. demands placed upon people and the skills, the developmental skills they have to handle it. And if you hit the sweet spot, they can handle those expectations and they even have to stretch a little. But if the gap's too big, that's when you see the kind of chaos and, and uh, problematic behavior that we've been discussing. I am mindful that we are about to run out of time here. Um, I, I want to point to one other comment, Frank, who said, this is all awesome. Um, I've been thrust into a coaching position when I have never coached before. Seventh and eighth grade boys basketball. <laughs> Everything I've heard so far is great, but any additional advice for me? Um, Frank, I hope you got lots of advice in those last few minutes, um, but if uh, any of our panelists want to give a quick sound bite to Frank. Um, Here's the best advice. Connect with Coach V. Coach V's on this call somewhere, right? Yes. Connect with Coach V. She'll, she's your Huckleberry. She'll take care of you. <laughs> um, All right. I would just, I would add one thing. Um, let the kids teach you. Yeah. yeah. And, and a good way to let the kids teach you is be curious, right, Megan? Um, Absolutely. Be curious, be open-minded, ask questions, take information in. Uh, we hope this webinar has been really helpful to folks. We realized we didn't have a chance to get to all the questions, uh, but it was just an example of uh, the sort of the engagement from the group here. Um, perhaps we'll have a chance to follow up and uh, do another one like this. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll also uh, reach out to everybody with a link to the recording that you can uh, watch or share with others, but also some resources for people who are wanting to follow up uh, to learn more. I want to uh, thank Megan, thank Rudy, thank Barfield, thank Natasha, and thank uh, Bruce for sharing your uh, experience and your expertise with us here. And uh, remember, people do well if they can. Kids do well if they can. Parents do well if they can. Coaches do well if they can. We're all doing the best we can to handle what's being thrown at us with the skills that we're able to access in that moment. Uh, hope this is helpful, folks. Thanks so much for joining us. Take care, everybody. <laughs>